Um, thank you all for joining us tonight. Um, most of you uh, know me, for those of you who don't, I'm Freda Eisenberg. I'm the planning commissioner for the county, and um, we uh, run these trainings periodically for uh, planning and zoning boards to members to get their required uh, uh, continuing education credits. Um, tonight's workshop is provided uh, with generous funding from uh, Natural Lands through the William Penn Foundation's Upper Delaware Watershed Initiative. And um, uh, there are you know, a number of communities uh, in Sullivan in what's called the Pocatoke Kinetini Cluster. Um, uh, I'm sorry, um, I was just getting some feedback there. Uh, in any case, um, the Watershed Initiative provides funding for uh, you know, lots of things. Um, yeah. Tonight's yeah. presentation is, is one example, yeah. but they also have small $5,000 grants available to communities that are in the watershed area um, for to help with uh, conservation zoning. And you can use your own planner. Um, I think there's a required 25% uh, municipal match. And if you're interested, just contact the planning department um, at any time and, um, uh, you know, and, and we'll uh, connect you with um, natural lands. So tonight's um, Zoom presentation, we have, uh, is going the Zoom function is going to be administered by Cassandra Johnstone, who's a planner in our office, and um, she can mute, unmute, um, work the chat, Q&A, all that kind of stuff, and I'm just going to hand this over to uh, Cassandra just for a few minutes to, uh, to talk about the, the logistics of the Zoom. Hello, everyone. So as Freda said, I'm Cassandra Johnson. I'm a planner at the Division of Planning. Um, so just a couple of housekeeping items before we let Randall get started. Um, this Zoom will be recorded. Um, it will be made available to you guys in the next week or two. Um, but given that it will be recorded, please remember if you're on camera um, or if you have your microphone on at any point, that will also be recorded. Um, I'm gonna ask everyone to please remain on mute for the time being, uh, just because of the sheer amount of people on here. If you do have questions, please put them in your chat box, um, in the chat box, and the lovely Kate from Natural Lands will be helping me moderate questions to make sure that we can um, get your questions answered. Um, we might have time at the end you know, for people to unmute if they have some questions or comments, but right now as the presentation goes on, we will be using the chat function. So um, message me or message Kate Raman if you need any help with that. Um, and then finally, and what I know everyone um, wants to know the most is certificates. Uh, I'll be taking attendance and I will be uh, creating the certificates this week. So I will be sending them to the town and village uh, clerks. And if you're an individual, I'll be sending them directly to you. So if you need um, a certificate for any other reason, uh, please contact your town or village uh, clerk <coughs> or if you need one individually. Um, that is all for me. I'm very happy to have Natural Lands with us tonight and Randall Arendt. And um, with that, I'll let him share his screen. And again, I oh, stay on mute. Yeah, and okay. I was just gonna do the intro to Randall um, <laughs> just for a few minutes. Uh, Randall is um, what we refer to in, in the planning world as a, a bit of a rock star. He's a, a landscape planner, site designer, lecturer, um, and uh, uh, most notably an advocate of conservation planning. He literally wrote the book on conservation planning uh, back in the, the 80s, um, beginning with the change in the, in the Connecticut River Valley. Uh, that was a kind of seminal uh, work in, in uh, creating conservation planning and it was actually inspirational in, in me uh, heading to graduate school. Um, Randall has written more than 20 books. Uh, uh, one of them, um, Rural by Design, is listed in, you know, among the top, uh, you know, essential books for, for planners from the American Planning Association. Um, he is, uh, he's gotten, you know, a fellow of the Royal Town Planning Institute in London, um, has gotten a, a number of honorary awards um, from the, one from the American Society of Landscape Architects and, uh, 
um, uh, the American Institute of Architects. And also in uh, 2008, he received an honorary degree from the uh, Conway School of Landscape Design, which is my alma mater. So um, I like to have that connection. Um, tonight, he's going to be talking about form-based zoning. Um, this topic actually came about because I think Jane Luxinger, who's uh, here in the Zoom somewhere, reached out to us and, uh, and asked uh, if we had any trainings for, for form-based zoning. We were talking with um, uh, Kate and, and Anne from Natural Lands uh, because they are you know, providing trainings and, um, and here we are. So uh, with that, I'm just gonna hand it over to Randall. Um, he will talk and then we'll have lots of time for questions and answers and people can also use the chat um, feature you know, during, during the talk. Thanks. Okay, I'm going to... Uh start the the program uh i think i did screen share and slide show from beginning <clears throat> okay uh welcome to the program this evening i'll be talking about a simpler way to regulate the form as opposed to form-based zoning which is often very elaborate expensive um lengthy form-based design standards really builds upon uh, a familiar tool in the planner's toolbox, which is design standards. But rather than simply design standards for streets or stormwater um, or even conservation subdivisions, uh, this would be a, a design standard regulating the form, the shape, the location of buildings, parking, uh, the, the, the types of things on the facade of the buildings. Um, so without further ado, um, let's see. Here we go. Uh, Frida mentioned Role by Design, uh, one of the, the, the books I'll be drawing from in this talk. Um, I like to begin with where people enter your town. They enter a town through a gateway, and that's the first impression. For uh, better or for worse, this is the first thing they see. First impressions tend to be lasting impressions. Is this the lasting impression that we'd like to impart on our visitors? Um, this is on the main coast, um, one of the least attractive communities in the main coast, but I won't mention which one. But luckily, all such commercial strips have a second chance, maybe even a third chance, because nothing built on those commercial strips has been built for more than a 20 or 30 year design life. So down they come. The question is, what replaces them when they come down? Uh, will it just be an, another McDonald's in the same format? Uh, our regulation should be really founded on a community vision. And the community vision uh, is often uh, discovered through visual preference surveys or image preference surveys. Uh, and I know a lot of you are familiar with it, but for the ones you are not, uh, typically an audience will look at 100 different images pretty quickly, maybe five seconds, six seconds each picture. And they would rate them from minus 10 to plus 10, depending upon what they thought of them. At the end of the exercise, the ratings are average for each image. So you get an average rating for each picture, and then you rank them lowest to highest and play them back to people so they can see what they have rated highest and lowest. <clears throat> and the conclusions that come out of this can inform um, the policy recommendations. Now, with years and years of experience with these surveys, it's almost um, axiomatic that the results are going to be that people prefer this following list, uh, two-story buildings or maybe even three closer to the street, parking that's visually is minimized to the rear, lots of trees in the parking lot, building design is reflective of regional traditional styles, uh, pedestrian walkways and sitting areas, uh, and good landscaping and, and, and street trees along the sidewalks. So if you go through a, a visioning process, you might like Warwick, New York, <clears throat> which is almost in New Jersey, it's way down in the southern end of uh, New York State, uh, Putnam County, I believe, or Orange County, I'm not sure. Um, I guess it's Orange or maybe it's Rockland, I'm geographically challenged. I haven't been there in a long time. 
This is what Warwick, New York looks like at its gateway. Just like a lot of other communities, uh, it wasn't very thrilling. They use that as a site to remake, to do over, based upon the images they saw in the preceding uh, part of the afternoon. And as a result of the group effort, uh, an artist came in and generated this picture showing what people had said they wanted to see. And obviously you see multi-story buildings closer to the street, the parking behind, lots of shade trees, uh, no surprises. Then they adopted some form-based design standards. This is the first building to come in under that. And it's a rural area, so you uh, therefore don't have the buildings right at the edge of the highway. Um, Simsbury, Connecticut uh, did a form-based zoning ordinance um, and it ran to, I think, about 100 pages, which was about the length of their zoning ordinance before they added another 100 pages. So this is one of the reasons I like to advocate form-based design standards. Um, you get good results with form-based zoning. Simsbury is getting good results, but it was a three-year process it cost them a ton of money, um, and they needed professional staff to implement it. Um, so a lot of the towns that I work with um, would rather have something simpler. But the results you get from form-based zoning, as in Simsbury, uh, this is their regulating plan, are indeed very good. I just don't like the, uh, the, the price tag and the complexity. So to implement the community vision, um, we have a choice. We can use form-based codes as an amendment to the zoning ordinance, or we can use form-based design standards, uh, which would be incorporated in the subdivision and land development ordinance uh, in Pennsylvania, that's their jargon. So what, is, what would downtown examples look like of form-based uh, codes? Uh, this is Dover, New Hampshire, and they did a, a, a form-based code um, that is unusual because it cost them only $40,000 and it was 20 pages long. So this is one of the better, or shall I say more appropriate form-based codes that a smaller town uh, uh, might want to, to look at. But if you're more rural than that, <clears throat> I've got a very small downtown, you might not want to go the form-based code route. Uh, whether you do form-based design standards or form-based codes, there are a couple of really very basic parameters. One is a maximum setback, known here as the build to line, the build to zone. The other is the build up line or the maximum setback. So instead of having minimum front setbacks, we have maximum front setbacks. Instead of maximum building heights, we've got minimum building heights. So we're doing things differently to get a different result. <clears throat> the storefront <clears throat> facade should be regulated. <clears throat> so there's a, uh, a large expanse of glass and a, a uh, an entrance to the front street. The front facade could be uh, altered a bit, modified, so there's a sitting alcove, as shown here, um, or, or not. <clears throat> there are a number of parameters for form-based design standards, this, the simpler uh, approach that I'm advocating. And as I said earlier, maximum front setback, minimum building height, minimum street frontage, uh, so you build up the street frontage to avoid gaps between the buildings. Parking is reduced and located to the rear or to the side and very thoroughly screened. If you're dealing with new um, <clears throat> layouts, you would want to have a parameter in there for a maximum block length. Uh, you want to encourage a broader mixture of uses and regulate them through performance standards. I call them good neighbor performance standards so that they um, allow people to do many different things in their buildings as long as they don't say, cross the line and create problems for their abutters or people in the upper floors. Standards for shade tree planting, uh, entrances onto the street rather than to the, uh, just to the rear, uh, minimum glazing to the street, uh, variety in residential buildings, types. If you're extending this into residential neighborhoods, you really want to encourage 
uh, not only single family, but two family, three family, four family. And uh, if you're in a rural area, you could use design standards to have a maximum lot size uh, so that you've got room left over within the layout for neighborhood parks. <clears throat> now some downtown examples uh, of form-based design standards, not form-based codes, not form-based zoning, is this from Saratoga, New York, which was uh, designed and built before they adopted form-based zoning. Now Saratoga is a big place. So they're certainly large enough with a big enough staff to have form-based zoning, which they do have. But before they adopted it, uh, this is what they uh, produced without the form-based zoning. And I think it's an actual, it's one of the best examples I've seen anywhere. The two red brick buildings are clearly the new ones. Davidson, North Carolina replaced a uh, gasoline station in the upper right-hand corner with a two-story um, CVS. And CVS was not going to uh, come to Davidson if they required two-story construction, and, but Davidson held firm and called the bluff of CVS, which acquiesced because they really wanted to be in downtown Davidson, uh, and they built a two-story building, which they otherwise would not have gotten without their form-based design standards. This is a close-up of that. I want to go back um, and show you on the bottom right-hand corner is a gasoline station like the one that was in the upper right hand corner. I, I believe a slide coming up will show you what replaced that second gasoline station. That there's, there's it, that's it right there. So the second gasoline station is replaced not by a two story building, but by a three story building. It's a small college town, maybe about eight or 9,000 people. This is from Durango, Colorado and it's clearly a modern building, but it has the lines of a Victorian building. In fact, it's kind of an echo of that building right across the street. So the architects in the town had a, quite a bit of fun uh, in creating a design which was sympathetic to their historic character, but not a slavish reproduction. This is a, a, a new building in downtown uh, Freeport, Maine with form-based design standards. Another one, uh, one of the L.L. Bean outlet buildings. Um, the Arby's in, in, in Freeport, Maine built so well, um, it, it exceeded the town's design standards. The town did not have any authority to regulate the architecture in this way, but the developer saw the advantages once they explained the form-based design standards and how it could really fit in with the historic character. He went the extra mile on his own volition to create that uh, architectural design. Uh, much simpler one, um, also in Freeport, Yankee Candle above Maiden Forum. Um, the Rite Aid Pharmacy, also along the main coast um, in Camden, Camden, Maine, Unfortunately, what you see above the ground floor is all make-believe. Great Aid built the entire thing. The entire ground floor is a standard Right Aid layout. And they were going to do a one-story building and Camden said, not so fast. We want you to do something different. Um, and they leaned on them. But unlike Davidson, they did not get a functional second story. And I think that, that was... Um, you know, something we can learn from. We definitely want that second story in a downtown setting and maybe in some highway settings, but we want to make sure they're functional. These are functional. Uh, these are in Pewaukee, Wisconsin, about 15 miles west of the city of Milwaukee. Um, on the right, that's all one building, made to look like a half a dozen buildings with different uh, roof lines and different setbacks. Um, and the second floor was all rented out uh, almost immediately. Not a hugely bustling small town, but a nice little resort community. And they did, have, they did not have any second story uses prior to that. Uh, these second story uses were designed to be residential in the small town of Connecticut, Connecticut but the town would not allow any mixed uses. They thought it was uh, immoral, I think. They didn't want 
uh, different mixtures to commingle on the same lot. This was 25 years ago. They, they, they've grown up since then. But the developer was allowed to build it only if he made the second story offices like uh, you know, similar to the first story retail. Uh, that was a sad case because the developer could easily have rented out the second floors immediately for residential, but in this tiny little town on the northwestern corner of Connecticut, he spent years trying to fill that second story with commercial space only because the Planning and Zoning Commission was so hung up on the idea that you shall not mix uses. Uh, this is an aerial photograph. It shows the alcove uh, in the front and an interior courtyard. It's a very nice design and ultimately it was uh, successful, but it took a while uh, because there was very little demand for office space in Kent, Connecticut. This is an alcove dating from the 1920s in Southern Pines, uh, North Carolina. That's down near, well, sort of near Raleigh and Durham. And you see not only a, a place for trees to really grow and thrive, but you find sitting areas and you find not only shop windows facing the street, but also shop windows facing uh, the sidewalk in one direction. And then the other side, th there's a duplicate of this. It's an, uh, a U-shaped building. You get shop windows facing um, in the other direction. So from a commercial development, this developer really troubled the amount of display space and the amount of shop fronts that he got simply by creating an alcove, which was an inviting place for people to you know, sit and rest. And uh, I uh, you know, recommend that design technique highly. Here's another example of that in Qualicum Beach on Vancouver Island. And it's at a street corner. So it really violates a parameter form-based codes, which is to bring your building to the street, particularly at a corner. But I think occasionally that rule can and should be bent to create a space like this. Oxford, Ohio is the home of Miami University. And over the years, many two and three story Victorian buildings all burned or torn down and replaced by single story buildings. Well, what's replaced that is this. And the town, without any form based codes, adopted design standards and worked with architects uh, and private entrepreneurs to create dormitory space for the University of Miami students above the ground floor. There are 12 such buildings in downtown Oxford, Ohio. That was before and after, another before and after another before and after. And these are essentially downtown dormitories, uh, which have taken the pressure off of uh, rental housing in, in neighborhoods. <clears throat> landscaping is a really important uh, uh, design standard. And this is a, a landscape screen consisting of uh, a wooden fence and Rosa uh, Ragosa bushes uh, in Camden, Maine. Another view of that same parking lot. Uh, in Brunswick, Maine, it's all vegetation screening the, uh, the hotel's you know, parking lot. Uh, in Holland, Michigan, it's a combination of uh, railings and brick walls and flower beds and trees and shrubs. The, the rear parking in Holland, Michigan is, is well treed. And as in Bath, Maine, there are rear entrances to the shops. So if you want to go to Wilson's uh, drugstore, uh, you go head to the blue awning and go in um, and the basement is at that level and you go up one level and you're at street level. Uh, so you get two floors of shopping. It, back in Holland, Michigan, these are the rear entrances to the buildings, much, much more nicely landscaped with sitting areas and trees and pavers. Uh, so the backs of buildings can really have a very inviting park-like setting. This is a very well-treated parking lot uh, in Brunswick, Maine. 
uh, originally created by Bowdoin College, but since uh, bought the building and the parking area by the town of Brunswick for their municipal offices. And there uh, is one tree for, I think, every um, three or four parking spaces, a really, really high ratio. And this is what it looks like with the leaves on the trees at ground level. Um, a, a tree planting strip uh, created in front of the Sunoco gasoline station 40 years ago in Amherst, Massachusetts, still waiting for any trees to be planted. So you really need to make sure those trees are installed and maintained for at least one year uh, as a condition of approval. This is another example of uh, a gasoline station in a downtown setting. This is from Red Hook, New York, Dutchess County. Um, and what we see here is a, essentially a screen that holds the street line. So even though th there's a pre-existing gasoline station with the pumps in front of the building, and therefore the building set back maybe 35, 40 feet, the street line is at least kept by this line of, of uh, closely planted uh, deciduous trees. We need to maintain them as, as well as plant them. Uh, here are some slides from Vinnie Catrone, works for uh, Penn State Extension, uh, showing irrigation lines and uh, how trees should be properly planted in downtowns. Uh, this is a, a, a photograph from Bath, Maine, uh, showing the irrigation pipe. Um, this is a, a, a really good way to irrigate below the surface because that pipe will go down maybe three or four feet to the bottom of the tree pit <clears throat> and the pipe will be filled with water which slowly percolates down into the bottom of the root ball. Sometimes, but not always, those vertical pipes are attached to other pipes which encircle the, the tree pit. Uh, Rockland, Maine has used uh, a lot of plantings in its downtown uh, to buffer the parking areas in the busy street from the pedestrian zone. Um, and in Bar Harbor, um, more trees and benches um, gives a human scale. Honeyway Falls in, well, surrounded by Menden, New York, up near Rochester, <clears throat> has a program in which trees are planted uh, partly by the village government, partly by the landowner, partly by a civic organization like Rotary or Kiwanis um, or JCs. And over the years, they've planted over a thousand trees in that tiny village by sharing the cost in a very formalized but voluntary program. <clears throat> Now along highway corridors, we have several goals. The first goal is a multiple goal consisting of the rear parking, minimum height, maximum front setbacks, um, and shade tree plantings. So instead of this result, the same amount of floor space could be organized and drawn closer to the street. It's a design manual done by Harry Dodson Peter Flinker for the state of Rhode Island about 15 years ago. In um, on Route 20, um, in a suburb of Boston whose name Sudbury finally come to me, this uh, building housing about a half dozen shops was built about 15 years ago with front entrances that are functional but not used very much. What are used are really the rear entrances because this is the edge of the village as you enter, almost the gateway location. So 90% of the customers arrive in cars or trucks. <clears throat> this is an area view of that same complex uh, on Route 20, entering the, the uh, small town of Sudbury in the western suburbs of Boston. A tiny bank in a tiny hamlet uh, in Sussex County, Delaware, hugging a street corner with the parking uh, behind. In Freeport, Maine, a highway example, most of their examples are within the village, but this is coming into Freeport from, basically it's on Route 1 coming off of, I, uh, of, of the interstate.
from Lincoln, Rhode Island, these buildings uh, were built to mimic the Victorian um, industrial architecture of Rhode Island. So, but it's done in wood, and you can tell from an instant that it's this, that it's a contemporary building, but you also can tell by the the form and the massing, uh, particularly uh, the fenestration, the windows being taller than they are wide. Um, that this building has been designed specifically to blend in with the mill architecture of Northern Rhode Island. There's no reason on God's green earth to have gasoline pumps in front of the gasoline stations. Uh, from a uh, small town of South Kingston, Rhode Island, uh, this mobile station uh, is lo located close to Route 138, but with the, the pumps behind it. In Topsom, Maine, on Route, um, I think it's 24, um, a shell station was built about five years ago with the pumps in the back. In this case, because it's not in the downtown location, all of the entrances are at the back, but the front has got large windows and awnings. This is a, another picture of that same uh, complex, and this is an aerial photograph of that same complex. And in Bennington, Vermont, the town struggled for about a year with Cumberland Farms to bring their building their, uh, closer to the street. And Cumberland Farms wasn't going to budge, and Bennington wasn't going to budge. Uh, but Bennington had greater uh, staying power, and they knew that Cumberland Farms really wanted to be at that corner. If Cumberland Farms wasn't going to be at that corner, somebody else was going to be at that corner, uh, and whoever it was is going to build according to the town standards. The second goal of form-based design standards is encouraging the mixtures of uses, um, such as this residential above, uh, retail on the left, and perhaps offices on the right, probably retail as well. Rose Street Market in Freeport, Maine, outside the village proper, uh, contains a grocery store uh, on the left uh, and a residential building here. Uh, this is all part of the grocery store down here at this level. So it's a fairly large floor plan. Um, and in addition to having the, the, the residential, those are affordable units. The town worked with the developer about a year on this because it was a complex project and the architecture was really, really of his own volition. Um, although they had design standards that would have required something uh, excellent in any case. Uh, it's a, obviously a very sloping site and behind the site back in here is a little park. So the developers created a pathway on benches leading down to the park, uh, Leo Gorm Gorman Park right uh, back down in here. That's the pathway that leads into it. So this is the, the grocery store in here, and this is the, um, the affordable housing. And this is another part of that uh, property, but it's a pre-existing building that wasn't um, changed. Residential above groceries, why not? This is senior housing above uh, a food store in the heart of Banff, uh, which is either in Alberta or British Columbia. It's right on the border, Banff is. Um, second story uses above ground floor uh, retail outside of Charlotteville, a tiny hamlet, um, and all the second floor is offices. But this, is, this has residential component as well. And the residential component is in the back, back in here. So we have in the front, ground floor retail, second floor offices, and in the back, residential. It all works very well. Third goal is to plant trees along the highway corridors, going back to Vancouver Island, entering uh, Victoria. This is the gateway to Victoria, BC, uh, the capital of BC. Uh, it's definitely a commercial strip, uh, but it's one of the more pleasant ones I've seen anywhere. Almost in BC, this is Renton, Washington, down near Tacoma. Uh, these trees were all planted 
um, about 25 years before that photograph was taken. Now those trees are probably about 45 years old. Uh, and they were planted really because the town manager, Renton, went to an Arbor Day conference, became excited about planting trees along this really ugly commercial corridor, which is Route 900 uh, in Renton, Washington. And he worked with the town council and the, the planning board and the landowners, stakeholders, building meetings, and everyone agreed that they could plant trees there, but everyone also agreed that they would have to limb up the trees so as you drove down the highway, you could still see the commercial buildings because they didn't want to be obscured. Fair enough. Uh, someday, the buildings in the back will be replaced because they don't have a, an infinite design life. <clears throat> trees along um, the Bath Road, connecting Brunswick with Bath in, in Maine. This is Don Fauché's uh, tire uh, and car repair uh, place. So you can see a, a very close setback from the highway and the parking had to be at the side, but these river birches really um, hold that street line very, very well. Uh, the fourth and final goal of form-based design standards is to connect adjacent land uses so that vehicles can go from one rear parking lot to another like an alley. But out in the commercial strip, we don't have alleys, but we can require that rear parking be connected. So that's a, an old diagram from the first rural by design, 1994. And this is an example of what you would see if you come to Thompson, Maine, which is next to Brunswick, where I live, and you see all the ways to get through, uh, you know, going through the parking lot so you don't have to go out to these park, uh, traffic lights along uh, the uh, Topsom Fair Road. Now, applying this to gateway locations, if you're coming off the main turnpike um, and going to your vacation house in Wells or wherever, one of the first things you see in entering the state of Maine is the Tourist Bureau for the town of York. And they knew that they wanted to create a, a great first impression, so they built this uh, just as be the first thing people see of the town of York when they leave the main turnpike. In addition to that, uh, pretty much next door to the tourist uh, bureau is the Stonewall Kitchen uh, complex uh, with a stormwater basin and stone wall uh, close to the highway and the buildings further back. And the buildings uh, are reminiscent of main uh, vernacular uh, farm architecture. This is the complex from the sky and entering the, uh, the driveway uh, from Route 1. Going back to Route 1, this is the Kenny Bunk Savings uh, Bank. Uh, and you can see how close it is to the highway, how well screened the one lane of parking is. Instead of having a large parking lot, they have got just one row of cars here. So the building is still pretty close to the street. It's what I call a fairly you know, suburban location. It's not the heart of York Village by any means. Uh, this is a, just a, a, a few blocks down from the Kennebunk Savings Bank. It's the uh, Sanford Institute for Savings Bank at the corner of US Route 1 and Main Route 91. On Route 1A in Wickford, Rhode Island, Staples brought their building close to the street. And as in another recent example you just saw, they put the parking to the side, not to the back, but to the side, screened it very well. And uh, as they brought the building very close to the street, it was essentially a blank wall. They did not want windows. And Wickford said, OK, if you don't want windows, we don't want to see a blank wall either, <clears throat> so you're going to landscape it really, really well. Rural highway locations allow somewhat deeper front setbacks, very little front parking, if any. So here's the entryway, the gateway to uh, a small village in Ulster County. Um, Stone Ridge. It, Stone Ridge, that's right. Thank you very much. It's part of um, the town of Woodstock, and not the Woodstock where the, 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 uh, the festival was. So in the Hudson River Valley, you'll recognize these uh, very traditional Dutch roofs, 
with the porches, the verandas, and in the back, uh, something that the Dutch never had was rear parking. Along Route 9 in Kennebunk, Maine, uh, the, the original house is partly obscured by the uh, uh, photographs on the right, but this is the original house, and this is um, a shed that he built, and then he built this commercial building and that commercial building and that commercial building, all in, during the 1950s and early 1960s. It was a great success. It was uh, followed by a second row of buildings in the back, because all the parking was at the rear, clearly. clearly. Um, and it was my first um, introduction to post-war commercial development that actually looked good. In Effort, uh, Pennsylvania, which is up near Broadheadsville, um, this row of six shops, three on the ground floor and three on the second floor, uh, hug the, the, the highway to the right is a large lawn, which is the best area for a septic system. And the next picture shows the septic system area. That's why th this building was not built out here, because this was not as good soil for septic as that. So sometimes you need a, 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 a deeper front setback for a practical reason, like soil suitability for septic systems. Uh, the Metamac Veterinary Services is way out uh, in a rural area off Route 1 in Nobleboro, Maine. And again, the, the architecture is reflective of the region. Um, another picture of that one that I showed you earlier from Warwick, New York. Um, a grocery store and a bank along Route 166 in Middlebury, Connecticut. And the interesting thing is the grocery store is not visible from the highway. What is visible is the bank. That's what you see right there, the, the, the drive-in, the drive-through. <clears throat> the bank is in the front and the grocery store is in the back. So the bank is right up in here. The grocery store is there. There's another range of buildings and it's a sloping site. So you, get, you enter the second story here at ground level and you enter the first story there at ground level at a lower elevation. In Broadheadsville, uh, a few years after Anne arranged for me to do a talk uh, on this subject, uh, the uh, Planning Commission and Board of Supervisors adopted regulations which resulted uh, in this uh, configuration of buildings. It's a medical center on the main road, the gateway into Broadheadsville. And not only is it uh, you know, uh, at a good relationship to the, to the street, but also the parking is behind and also the parking is well landscaped and also the well landscaped parking has got great rain garden stormwater infiltration uh, areas and galleries. So this is a truly outstanding example uh, from Northeastern Pennsylvania of form-based design standards with great stormwater and um, landscape parking areas. Supplemental design standards uh, can include pedestrian walkways and parking lots. When everyone arrives at the, to a, a shop, this is the IKEA in New Haven, in a vehicle, a, a car, a uh, pickup truck, a minivan. And as soon as they leave the car, they become pedestrians. But very, very little accommodation is made for pedestrians. And some pedestrians need more help than others. Some are walking on crutches temporarily. Some are walking with walkers because they're very old. Some are being pushed in wheelchairs. Some are very young and being pushed in perambulators or strollers. None of these should be out in the parking lot dodging cars and trucks. This is an example from Chester County, Pennsylvania. Same idea. And we can require this. This is not just something that can be uh, left as an optional extra. There's no reason we can't begin to require this. This is a retrofit that Professor Wendy Miller's landscape architecture students designed for a 1950s shopping center in Moscow, Idaho, where she teaches. 
Um, she's a Connecticut native and I've known her for years. And uh, when I was out doing a lecture there, one of the times that I went out to, to visit her students, she showed me this project. Um, I should have asked her to send me a one with the leaves on the trees be even nicer. But this was taking up some of the extra parking spaces that the old zoning ordinances had erroneously required and replacing it with, with trees and benches and a little bit of grass. To my way of thinking, there's just a bit too much hardscape there. And I would have tried to put in some more type of pervious uh, pavement. Well, for all I know, that's pervious concrete. Uh, it might be, given that Wendy was the uh, instructor on it. And in Bennington, returning to Bennington, Vermont for a moment, this is what the Walmart looks like uh, and is accessed in a, through a pedestrian uh, way, which is perfect for people that have had one martini too many. Um, the Walmart, however, uh, like the Rite Aid in Camden, is just to pretend second story, very sadly. But better than the alternative. <clears throat> So as I said earlier, as we get older, uh, some of us become a bit unsteady on our pins and uh, require a little bit of assistance in walking or uh, definitely don't want to be out in the parking lot in the midst of moving vehicles. Retaining existing trees on the site is something we should pay more attention to. And uh, there may be a need for a regulation which prohibits the developer from calling his development Pine Tree Plaza when the first thing he does is chop down all the pine trees. This Walmart would have chopped down all those trees. This is a view from the highway, except that it couldn't get enough highway frontage to put its parking lot there. The owner didn't sell to Walmart and Walmart built its building and its parking lot behind those trees. Um, this is from Midlothian, Virginia in the Richmond area and a grade change and a line of trees helps to make the front parking disappear in a layout that is from the early 1970s and therefore not a particularly good layout because there's massive parking in front. Um, but so a way that you could see to maybe retrofit one of those uh, through more tree plantings. Uh, from Middleborough, Massachusetts, um, a strip about 120 feet deep along the highway was kept with, uh, uh, with trees. And instead of building one-story buildings over more of the site, the developer built two-story buildings on a lesser portion of the site, allowing the front to remain uh, with lots of trees. McDonald's, uh, with a tree that lies just beyond McDonald's boundary. Otherwise, it probably would have been taken down because this is Florida where the regulations are not particularly good in terms of tree preservation. As a generalization, I'd say that. Now, the idea of parking groves is a kind of inversion of the parking lot because a parking grove is a grove of trees in which you park your car rather than a parking lot in which you plant trees. It's not an altogether, you know, uh, unrealistic idea. Uh, this is a, an example to show how you would do it uh, with a ratio of one tree for every three parking spaces. I first saw that in Germany and my wife said, don't even bother taking a picture of that because you'll never see it in the United States. Well, the next year I was out in Illinois in Rockford, Illinois, staying at a Best Western uh, after a slideshow. And I noticed in the morning how many trees there were in the parking lot. And I counted up the spaces and I counted up the trees. And lo and behold, there was one tree for every three spaces. So it can be done. It has been done. You don't have to travel to Europe to see it. Um, this is the if you'd come off the interstate in York and see some of the buildings I just showed, which were built according to design standards I helped the town of York adopt back in 1982, um, 
if you have the hankering to pick up some groceries on your way to your summer home on the main coast, you can stop in at Hannaford's, the big grocery store, which is back behind the Irving gasoline station. And this is what you'll see. Parking lot with one tree, not quite for every three spaces, but I think for about for every six, which is a huge improvement on what you normally find. So this is the entryway, uh, Hannaford sign there. You go up here about 300 feet, and as you approach Hannaford's, at the end of their driveway, basically what you see are trees, and more trees. And that's the same ratio as in here in downtown Brunswick. Um, and this is that example from, uh, that I showed you earlier from Brunswick. This is an example from Route 1 along the main coast. And what we have here is a lot of planting along uh, Route 1 in, in Rockport, Rockland, Maine. This is the Goodwill store. And this is their stormwater area. Look how many trees are in that stormwater area. So this is the view from the highway. The stormwater area is back outside the picture frame back in here, but this is about three years after they, maybe four years after they planted. Um, public art, I think, is an important uh, element to uh, downtown uh, developments. And I don't think it's something you can require, but it's something that you might be able to give some sort of incentive for or entirely separate from regulatory, uh, the regulatory realm, separate from form-based codes or zoning or, or design standards, you can do, you can encourage a lot of public art. Uh, it might take the, the, uh, the, the shape of faux windows as these from uh, Frederick, Maryland, uh, or more faux windows and murals from downtown Dover, New Hampshire, or uh, life-size uh, sculptures where tourists will, you know, insert themselves there and there uh, and over in here while their friends and relatives take their pictures. It's participatory public art. Public art can be mildly educational as this globe in downtown Eagle, Colorado or this uh, sitting bench uh, in Sheridan, Wyoming. It's one of six towns in that area. Coeur d'Alene, Idaho is another. I forget the other four. They've got programs locally generated and operated where they, the town creates these uh, concrete plinths with uh, bolts uh, poking up in them, threaded bolts. And the town invites artists to do sculptures and exhibit them for 12 months in this public art gallery. At the end of 12 months, the artist gets to take the art away, but he's had free display space for 12 months. Very often, those are sold within that 12 months. And instead of paying a 50% commission to a gallery, they pay a 25% commission to the town or the city, and they use it to create more plinths and to buy public art themselves. So they now have at least a dozen uh, objects of public art in their downtown and their parks, which they've purchased through this program. Cost them nothing. Here's some more public art from downtown Sheridan, uh, downtown Holland, Michigan. And in Holland, Michigan, this is maybe not quite public art, but it's good stuff. This is a gas fireplace with sitting areas all around it and, and landscaped, and it is a people magnet. They have a wide sidewalk on which it can be situated. Uh, the owner of the building built this structure on the public sidewalk with the town's permission. The town has taken over, as part of the original agreement, taken over the maintenance and operation of this facility so that a thermostat turns on every time the ambient temperature falls to, I think, 
60 degrees. Um, and it, it doesn't run all winter that way, but it basically is there for cool summer evenings and cool days in say April or early May or late September, early October. And it's part of, it, it, it's now become, you know, a central tourist attraction for the town of Holland. Even bicycle racks like this one in Sonoma, California can be a form of public art. So there's a lot to be, uh, a lot of opportunities. You won't get to build a bridge every uh, uh, lifetime in, in your town, but uh, occasionally that is, you know, comes into play. And in um, <clears throat> Willimantic, Connecticut, where it, known as Thread City, the spools represent the historic thread manufacturing, and the frog uh, represents um, an old story about Revolutionary War uh, episode where frogs were awakened by the redcoats crossing the river at daybreak, and the frogs were disturbed and they croaked at a time when they normally wouldn't croak, and the townspeople were alerted and saved the town because the frogs sounded the alarm. They're whimsical, uh, and they're public art, and you see them every day, and it makes your, your, your day a little bit brighter. So uh, I was asked to speak for about an hour, uh, which I have. Uh, I would, I'm looking forward to hearing all of your, your questions um, about any aspect. And my contact information is there. So um, you know, copy it down. You'll also be able to access this, I think, as Cassandra or Frida said, uh, through a recording um, in the future. So thank you very much. Uh, I await your questions. So Randall, we have three questions already. Um, Maisha was asking about parking minimums. Um, she was wondering if they, the having a minimum as opposed to a maximum is hindering pedestrian activity in the downtown. Um, a parking minimum, did you say? Yes. Um, she, the Because I wasn't speaking about a parking minimum, I was talking about a minimum setback, um, a maximum setback for the buildings. Um, maybe there was a slide that talked about minimizing the parking, um, but that would be minimizing the parking in a visible location. I, I should have uh, said that. I don't want to minimize parking uh, per se. I'd like to have as much on-street parking as possible, as much off-street parking, as long as it's not in front. If it's to the side, I've shown you several examples of how that could be screened. But I, I didn't mean to convey that parking should be reduced. That would just not fly uh, in any downtown I've ever worked in. And I want these ordinances to be accepted by the business community, not only accepted, but embraced. Um, the next question we had was from Ariel. Are the faux second stories known to be un uh, unfeasible or unmarketable? Is that why those those second story spaces go underutilized? Um, well, the second stories that are faux were built not to be used. For instance, in the Rite Aid in Camden, they're all full of um, trusses, diagonal supporting members. You can't walk through the place. They, it's almost as if they deliberately filled it full of lumber so you could never use the second floor. Now, the argument from Rite Aid was the same hollow, false argument that CVS used in Davidson, North Carolina. And that was a second floor tenant could, at 2 a.m., drill down through their floor, through the ceiling, and get into the area with a lot of uh, controlled substances, you know, uh, a lot of you know, nar narcotics. It is an absolutely, you know, ludicrous, um, you know, argument. If they were concerned about that, they just design a, a, a second floor with uh, a, a lot of, you know, metal plates that you can't easily drill down and cut through. But it's just a stupid argument. Um, in rural by in, in the new rural by design which I think a lot of you have, and if you don't, it's just a, an excellent book. Uh, don't take my word for it. Take, look at the reviews on Amazon, for instance. 
Look at my website, which is down the bottom. It's got more reviews. In the case studies, there is a, uh, a case study for South County Commons in South Kingstown, Rhode Island. It's a multi-use development along Route 1, the gateway to the village of Wakefield in the town of South Kingstown. They have two and a half story buildings. The second story and this half story above it were described to me by their developer as his lifeline because he, he told me that once they're rented up, people, and they rented up very quickly, people rarely move. It might be a, a, um, an army recruiting station. It might be a, a, an attorney's office. They, they don't move about. And for that reason, it's the steady um, financial revenue stream that he can count on even as the ground floor tenants come and go as they do. Restaurants come, they may open a few years and they close. Uh, another person comes in with a great idea for retail, but it doesn't fly and he's shut down in 18 months. People that own commercial premises know that ground floor retail is finicky, not reliable, whereas the second floor tenants are just the opposite. And he says the, the secret to his success was not just building a second floor, but building a half floor above that. And you can access that case study in, I think it's chapter 23 of Rural by Design. Rural by Design is currently underneath the laptop <laughs> that I'm using for this presentation. So if anyone wants me to go to chapter 23, I can do that in a minute. Um, Jane has a question about highway trees appropriate for zone five. What kind of trees are appropriate along the highway? Yes, in, in uh, you know, growing zone five. Zone five. Uh, well, I imagine that's no more uh, harsh than where I live up in Maine. Um, the river birches have done very well up here, uh, both in residential subdivisions and as you saw along the, the Bath Road at, by the Don Fauché Tire Center. Um, so I would highly recommend river birch. Um, I'm just trying to think of trees that might be problematical. Um, and I'm not the best person to consult on that um, because I, I would go to an arborist uh, at extension, corporate extension, and ask that question because you want to make sure that you don't have trees that are too much affected by the salt spray because um, you'll get a lot of that in the wintertime in zone five. So mostly, most evergreens, I think, would be not a good choice. Um, but I would, I'm thinking normally of deciduous trees anyway. If you're thinking about deciduous trees, bear in mind that the red oak grows twice as fast as the gray oak, which means that it's a very fast snail. It's not a fast grower, but as an oak goes, it's, it's the best. Um, I, I, and also just I, I, I know the sycamore trees grow very well and London Plain grows very well, but I don't know about zone five. I would be a little bit hesitant uh, unless it's in a more sheltered location. But the corporate extension tree people should be able to give you a pretty good answer on that. And anyone that wants a case study of that South County Commons with the second story commercial, Take note of my email address. If you don't have rural by design, I'll email you the case study in a PDF file. Um, Cornell University apparently also has some excellent examples of um, trees that can tolerate the cold in different kinds of conditions. Um, we did have another question from Freda. Are the mixed 
uses and the, the specific mix of uses driven by the developer or the municipality? And what can municipalities do to um, get creative about what, what uses can be mixed? What does the municipality do to encourage it or to regulate them so they don't become incompatible? Encourage it. So you have these great examples of mixed use projects. And, you know, if um, this area doesn't have visionary developers who are coming in to say, I'm going to put housing with my supermarket or, you know, whatever, uh, how is there a way for municipalities to, to drive that creativity? One of the ways is to look at uh, the ULI standards for shared parking, because rather than just adding a residential parking standard to a commercial parking standard and going by the, uh, the square footage of each, um, you can um, look to see to what extent um, you'd be over providing parking by providing what the book would normally say. Um, so you should, I think, always look at the parking standards to see if they are asking developers to create more asphalt than is really needed. Um, and that's usually a nice incentive for developers not to have to build more parking lots and stormwater areas that are that much larger to accommodate that extra runoff. Um, there may be uh, intensity bonuses or density bonuses that you could uh, provide to say that uh, your uh, second story uses um, do not require uh, more land uh, component because you're stacking them. Um, if you're in a downtown location in a college town, and this is a very, very special case, but the I live in a college town and Oxford, Ohio is a college town. If you're going to have dormitories on the upper floors, you don't need to have any student parking on that property because the students are students of the college or university and they're going to have their own parking spaces somewhere on campus. That's a very special uh, situation. Um, also parking for senior housing, well known to be a much lower um, provision requirement. So that's a way to get senior housing perhaps uh, where you want it within walking distance of shops um, and the developer uh, would only have to provide a small amount of parking because the residential component is a senior population with typically one car per household. So basically what you're saying is a developer comes in with a, a single use project and a board can respond by saying, you know, we'd really like this, you know, uh, second story, mixed uses, and we'll cut you a deal on parking. Is that is that basically what you're what you're saying? Yes, and also to emphasize to him that he makes much better, more efficient use, gets more bang out of the buck for every uh, foot of foundation and for every square foot of roof, because they they remain equal whether you're building a single story or two story or three story, the foundation and the roof are the same. So you actually build less expensively when you begin to stack. And certainly if it's a sloping site at all, it becomes almost a no brainer because the sloping site um, doesn't require really any stairways to go or, or lifts because the front of the building is at uh, a different elevation than the back of the building because of the ground slope and everyone enters the building at grade. So wherever you have a graded site, you know, a sloping site, that's the easiest place to encourage the, the, uh, the, the extra story. 
Okay. Thank you. I'll hand it back to Kate. Thanks, Freda. Uh, we have some updates in the notes um, regarding resources for trees. The, I know the Sullivan County Renaissance study had a uh, link also to trees appropriate for the area. We don't have any more questions um, at this time in the chat, unless, I, unless I've missed one. If I've, if I've missed anybody, please feel free to just unmute yourself and, and, uh, and ask your question. I'm going to jump in. Someone in the middle of the presentation asked whether Randall has uh, seen Monticello because, you know, we have, we've just seen all these amazing images of very sort of luxe resort areas. And um, if you've been to downtown Monticello, it's, it's not that. And I know Randall was here uh, a few years ago, 2014, 2015. I don't know what the, what the collective memory is, but um, if uh, there's anything you can say about applying some of what we've um, in here tonight to the downtown. And I will add that um, uh, both Thompson and Monticello recently in, in their East Broadway area um, passed uh, zoning regs that use that um, extra density bonus provision for complying with uh, you know, design objectives. Mm. That's very new. Well, it's been too many years since I've been to Monticello to, to recall uh, any specifics. Um, so I'm afraid I can't be very helpful there. Um, if you were to send me some more photographs or maybe I could just go on Google Earth uh, afterwards, I can you know travel down the highway virtually through Google Earth, you tell me, uh, if there are specific things I should be looking at, and I will, and we can speak on the phone. Okay. Um, we had another question. I'm just going to read it directly from the chat here so I get this right. Um, many communities are dealing with underutilized retail regional super centers. Can the dead malls be reimagined using form based code? I think the New urban literature has got quite a few examples on how to redo um, uh, those old malls, uh, short of you know demolishing them. Um, in the new rural by design, and I think maybe in the original one too, can't recall specifically, but I think so. Mashpee Commons, uh, an early example, Dwayne Plater Plater Zyberg. Uh, DPC example on Cape Cod um, showed how you could take a pretty dead shopping center and reimagine it as uh, a series of blocks with buildings built right at the street line, and sidewalks and shade trees. So in New England, that's the premier example, I'd say, and it's been around for a long time. The one thing that they did not do particularly well is the outer edge. So as you travel down the state highways that bound Mashpee Commons, you still see a lot of parking. But at the heart of it uh, is this core of little gridiron of streets, very nicely done. So. A, if you Google Mashpee Commons, you'll probably find a lot of articles on it. It's not easy to find, not easy to get to from where you all are from because it's way out on Cape Cod. Um, but again, if you don't have the new rural by design, send me an email and I'll send you a PDF showing the layout and some street level photographs and the, the narrative of, of Mashpee Commons as a makeover for a dead mall. Do you have any more questions from anybody? Oh, Freddie, you're muted. You're, you're muted. <laughs> How 
happens a lot. Um, I was just going to say, if, if there are no more questions, we'll call it an evening. And I just wanted to thank everyone, uh, let them know that uh, Cassandra will be sending out your certificates. And if, um, you know, in, in walking away from this, there are, uh, you know, more questions, just, you know, please send them on to us and we'll try and, and uh, you know, ferret them out for you. Um, if there's interest in uh, zoning changes, uh, uh, you know, to, to shift toward uh, some of the design examples that we've seen this evening, um, again, please let us know. And uh, for those communities in the Pocono, Kittatinny watershed along the, the Delaware, um, there may be funding for that as well. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Fred, I You're actually on. had a question. <laughs> Um, are, are, did we register for AICP credits and is there a link um, for, for those as well? Um, that one I'm going to punt to Cassandra. Oh. Yeah. Um, Maisha, if you wanted to turn on your mic and just talk a little more about that because I'm not an expert on that, um, but there, there are CM credits available. Yes, yeah, so I'm so sorry. Hi, everybody. I just want to quickly introduce myself as Misha Tyler, and I'm the incoming representative for uh, APA uh, Metro New York, Hudson Valley West. Um, there absolutely are uh, credits, uh, 1.5 CM credits, and all you have to do is just fill out that brief survey right there, um, and, uh, you know, they'll absolutely get those credits out to you. So, yes. <laughs> I think I put it in the chat. So. Yeah, so the survey is in the chat. Chat. Thank you, Maisha. I will leave um, this chat open and I won't end the meeting quite yet in case anyone needs to go in and copy and paste the link. Um, okay. Yes, so thank you for asking, Kate. <laughs> okay, if that's it, then thank you all so much uh, for joining us tonight and I'll get your certificates out in the next week or two um, and have a great night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Thank Good night. Good night. Take care. Good night. Thank you. Oh. Mm-hmm.